Everybody, welcome. My name is Jesse Randall. I'm the founder and CEO of Sweater, and I'm excited to be with you here again to talk more about the founder stories that we never talk about. Uh, founder Saga was really created at its core to help us understand, have more empathy for the early stage process of what really takes to get a company off the ground and to help set good expectations for you know all of the future founders that are out there that are going to choose to build a company. Because when we have better expectations, it's so much easier to find happiness and joy in the journey uh, and to know that you can come out the other side. Nobody's got it easy. So uh, today I'm so excited to have Jeremy Glasser with us from Eluma. So Jeremy, welcome. It's good to be here, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's totally my pleasure. So this is gonna be fun. Um, so I'm gonna have you give a quick overview of what Eluma does, and then I'm gonna share why it's important to me. Uh, it'll, I'll be vulnerable for a moment. So Ooh, I'm uh, excited to hear your story. Yes, well, it's not that exciting, but I don't talk <laughs> about it very much. So let's let's have you give a quick overview. Tell everybody what Eluma is all about. Hey, everybody. I'm Jeremy Glauser. I'm really excited to be here with the team at Sweater and Jesse. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, Eluma really is a two sided marketplace focused on bringing clinicians and students together. So we are focused on K-12 school systems across the U.S. because that's where a lot of the kids are found. And it's mm -hmm. a really good way to bring these services to them. And we've been at it for a decade now. Holy cow, it's been 10 years. Well, what was that that you told me right before the call started? Yeah, yeah well, it's a, a 10 year overnight success. And <laughs> I feel like even still it's a journey because uh, to be specific, our 10 years on September 5th of this year. So, you know, it's it's definitely a long journey, particularly when you're bootstrapping something. Uh, and, uh, you know, it takes a, a lot of grit. Oh, yeah. Well, that's that's fantastic. <laughs> um, why don't you tell everyone just a little bit more about exactly what Eluma does, like some of the yeah. maybe a little bit of a deeper view and, and give everyone a feel for that. Absolutely. And and where there's a lot that could be explored. So. Jesse, if you feel like we need to dig in, you just say, hey, Jeremy, let's go over there and I'll, I'll dig in. But, but really, it's, we're focused on the therapeutic experience, specifically for speech therapy, occupational therapy, and mental health counseling. But we also work uh, to provide school, psycho school psychology services, which is really focused on assessment and helping determine eligibility for kids in school systems to receive therapies, to receive these specialized instructional services. Mm -hmm. so, so our team is building the platform and creating the, the community of highly talented clinicians so that we can then assign those clinicians to the school systems that need them most. And they're mm -hmm. delivering the service through our platform. Yeah, yeah. So that's everything from scheduling to content to assessment, uh, billing us for their time. And then not only do we get this roll up of really cool information about the students and their progress, but also for the student, also for the schools. And I think those are the some, those are some of the cool, cool highlights that are coming down the pike. We're mm -hmm. investing more and more in technology to help these school systems monitor kids progress and understand mm -hmm. what kind of outcomes they're getting from these services. So that's, that's awesome. Pretty, it's, it's really fun. It, it, it's such a personal thing. It's, it's a mission that I know that I share in common with all the people on our team. We're not in this just to, you know, just get a paycheck and build some widget. We're in this because we really want to make an impact in the lives of real people kids and, and adolescents. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I, I have a lot of, uh, I guess, passion for, for helping young people discover themselves. I've, I've worked in youth groups for a long time. Um, yeah. But speaking of impact, so, uh -huh. so tell us more about like your reach. I mean, you said that you're across the US, but mm -hmm. can you kind of help us quantify what that mm -hmm. means? Absolutely. Uh, we are in 35 different states. And we have served just over 22,000 students. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, oh, and another cool statistic is we just passed 12 million minutes of therapy in schools, wow. which is a, 
a number that we like to track. Actively, we provide about 10,000 services for kids right now. So across schools in those 35 different states, there are 10,000 services being provided on a monthly basis. I love it. That's awesome. So I told you earlier that I wanted to share just my personal thing. Um, I'd love to hear it. Let's hear it. Okay. So, so second, first and second grade, here I was, my name's Jesse Randall and I was unable to pronounce my R's. Yes. So until I was about seven, I was Jesse Wandle. Yeah. And I still remember being taken out of class and I'd, I'd go down with the speech therapist and they had this side room off of like the faculty break room that no kid ever went to. I still remember being really nervous to go in there and they did all the things right i mean had had the tongue depressors and you know i had to go through these exercises and crow like a rooster and whatever else and um i'm so grateful first of all um that i could pronounce my own name now but i, I had the most amazing speech therapist and I, I didn't understand how important it was for me at the time um to go through that process but i'm so grateful that it was there so i, I usually don't tell people that story well, you know, it's it's actually, I think it's important for us to talk about these kinds of things. You know, when I was a kid, I didn't have a speech impediment, but I'm colorblind, number one. Um, and that made it really hard for things like chemistry. I had to get some special accommodations for that. And then when I hit high school, I started having anxiety attacks. And even to date, I experience anxiety and I have to learn coping mechanisms. Uh, my, I've got a daughter who's in speech therapy because she has a lateral lisp and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, another daughter who, who is being evaluated right now for speech therapy. Mm -hmm. These are kinds of things that are important for us to be able to talk about because I think that as a society, until we recognize that this is part of being human, um, and it, it's going to be a hard thing to accept it about ourselves. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the things about being young, and especially to me at least, going like between the ages of 11 and 18, that, for many it goes well beyond that, right? But just that process of figuring out who you are, right? Yeah. And how you fit into the world. And um, I think today there's more pressure than ever on young people. Um, I mean, I can't even imagine never being able to escape it with social media just being constantly hounding you. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and asserting expectations on you. I mean, it's a different world. And I, so I love that this is a service that could be so readily available to young people and in a medium that they understand. I, I just think it's fantastic. So it's very, very cool that you built this. Well, thanks for sharing, Jesse. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, uh, so let's, let's dive into the story of how you got here. Uh, you know, the 10 year overnight success. It's always fun to hear about that. <laughs> so Let's, uh, I call this the napkin. Well, moment. and we're so, still on a journey. I think that you're always, <laughs> what did Bill Gates say that you're, you know, cautiously optimistic about everything because you've got to make sure that you're, you're keeping an eye on the ball. So yeah, appreciate right. it. But yeah, it's, it's still a journey. No, I, I, I totally get it. Well, um, so let's jump in. I, I like to call it the napkin moment. So yeah. really going back in time, examining where this idea came from. Um, and, and why you felt inspired enough to actually go after it. Yeah, I, I get this question often enough that I think about it regularly, and there's, there's a lot of different experiences that go into it in details. Just real quick, my mom was a teacher, and my dad was a, a leader in the community, and a lot of people uh, knew who he was. And, and so growing up, I... I was no stranger to what it means to help people, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and my, when my mom died, I was 18 years old and it, it, it made me think seriously about a few things, but I was still young and immature and went off to college and, and started to, you know, soul search a little bit. But, but really what this comes down to for me is a collision of two of my passions. My mission is to help people fulfill their human potential. And at the same time, I studied linguistics in college and loved it. And so when I was working with an education startup company that was serving or, or basically developing a device to help people who couldn't articulate their sounds properly, this resonated with me. I was, I was talking mm -hmm. with, um, 
one of the independent contractors we were working with at, at Complete Speech, that was the startup name, and we were talking about how we could serve more, more kids with this device. The palatometer mm -hmm. is what it was called. And we, the, the idea came from research at the university level. There was this concept of teletherapy, delivering therapy through the telephone, through video. And uh, even 11 years ago, video was nowhere near as prevalent as it is now. And so that was kind of a novel idea. Ultimately, the idea of delivering that device and the service with that device through teletherapy didn't come to fruition. But what it did is it put me on a track to develop a technology and a solution that uh, mm -hmm. would bring therapists to kids. You know? Yeah. So, now, now that that by itself is really interesting to me because I, I don't know that people recognize how many times founders go down paths like that where they're pursuing something that doesn't necessarily work out, but it oh, takes yeah. you to a place where you have a different vantage point where you discover what you really end up doing. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, there was this guy who came into one of my classes at college and uh, I can't remember his name, but it was an entrepreneurship lecture series at BYU. And the guy called it the zigzag principle. And I've come to know what that means because you think you're going to do something and although you're headed in the generally right direction, man, do things crystallize as you get in there and really try to solve a problem. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Okay, so you went down that path. I kind of cut you off. You went down that path with the palatometer. Did it's I get called that the palatometer, right? and yeah. we were going to deliver it over uh, video conferencing. And ultimately, it didn't work out. There were just some scenarios that that made that uh, not possible. And um, what's interesting about this is um, I, <laughs> I funded, well, I, I say funded because ultimately I didn't use this money to build the business. I used it to buy palatometer devices, thinking that I would use those to create a, you know, a service with that device through technology. But when my grandma mm -hmm. died, I got $5,000 as an inheritance because my mom wasn't alive. And so I took that $5,000 and that's how I founded Illuma was to create this company that would deliver the palatometer to kids through online therapy or online video conferencing technology. Yeah, yeah. So I went out and I bought $5,000 worth of the palatometer and after like two months shelved them and never <laughs> used them. And, uh, and, and the guy, there was this independent contractor working with us at Complete Speech who I told you about. Uh, you know, great guy. Uh, after three months, we realized that we were both going in different directions. So I said, hey, I want to go and you have different objectives. So, you know, we made a little agreement and I took over and became the sole founder at that point. So we were co-founders for about three months. Gotcha. So, yeah, that's awesome. Well, and sometimes that's just the way it works, right? I mean, it's uh, it can be messy business in the early days. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, um, it's, it, it definitely can be. And and I think that that for for us, what became clear is that the opportunity met some people who thought we were ambitious and crazy enough and maybe even naive enough to tackle that opportunity. And and so, you know, we jumped on it and and then we he and I parted ways after three months and and uh, it's been almost 10 years since. Oh my gosh. So just out of curiosity, I mean, talking about that, you know, the founding team story, did you end up bringing anyone else with you after that? Or did you decide mm -hmm. to roll solo? I decided to roll solo um, because there were a lot of unknowns. Essentially, we were trying to create a new, uh, a new product in a new market. And I wanted to prove that we could do that. And so didn't bring anyone, decided not to raise capital. Anyone who's in education knows that the growth curve is different than other industries. And education seems to be a little bit more of a laggard when it comes to technology adoption. There's more policy, there's more uh, regulation that you have to, to adhere to. So mm -hmm. taking it the bootstrapped approach was a decision I made early on 
And uh, actually the way that, you know, for any entrepreneur out there, uh, it's, it takes a lot of capital to fund some kind of product build or software build, but to do services, it takes a lot less capital because you can do what you do and offer that for as a service, right? So I called up schools. I knew schools. That's I, I've dedicated my life to helping schools. So I had all these relationships that I, I called up and I said, Hey, do you need a therapist? I've got some. And then I would go to a list of therapists that I, I would source through different internet, uh, different websites on the internet. I'd call up the therapist, work out the deal, build a school, keep a cut and pay the therapist. Mm -hmm. And that's how I cash flowed enough in the early days to fund some of the development of the business and the ideas. You know? Yeah, I love it. And I think that the uh, the cash flowing services option for getting a company off the ground is way overrated, excuse me, underrated yeah, in, yeah. in the way that we examine it and how powerful it can be. You know, I mean, like I, I look at it and think that, you know, from that perspective, you know, most people are looking at it saying, um, you know, I've got to have this chunk of capital to go and build all this software, yeah. you know. When really, like you examine what you can do today with whatever problem you're solving, and almost always there's some way to provide a service that solves the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you know, if you can solve a problem manually, you can usually build software to help automate it, right? And so you can kind of ease your way in. And I, I've spoken with so many founders that started that way and generated hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars worth of services, and then just basically carving off the profits and putting it back into software. I think that's one thing I did know early on though, is that I wanted to create a software that would solve it long-term, mm -hmm. but it took us seven years to start investing in software. You know, we, I mean, even today, tech enabled services is a majority of our revenue and how we make money, but, but transforming into offering software as a service didn't really start for us until a couple years ago. So that really was intentional, but can I claim to know the end from the beginning? No way. It was a process. Um, you get smart people around you. You, you have grit. It's definitely going to be hard. And, and I, I mean, look, my definition of entrepreneurship is where is, is really where innovation and constraint collide. I don't think raising money is a bad thing. I actually applaud a lot of the capital that people are raising and going and doing it. But I've learned that the successful ones apply innovation and constraint. It's not good enough to raise capital and just spend it frivolous, frivolously, right? I mean, or spend it on the wrong thing. You've got to force yourself into constraints that make you think, how, uh, how do we innovate? How do we bring value to the market? Because that money that you raise or that money that you make from bootstrapping has to turn into more money. Because mm -hmm. no matter, I mean, I, we're a mission driven company, but we still need money to fulfill our mission. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that, that uh, that's important for us to understand here at Iluma, but I mean, just as an entrepreneur, we, we've got to make sure that we're innovating and bringing value with any dollars that we, we bring in. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, I love it. So, I mean, did I catch correctly that you didn't start building software for seven years? We started building software about five years ago, but there okay. were a lot of buy decisions versus build. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until about two or, th two or to three years ago where we really decided to invest in software development. So mm -hmm. over the past two to three years, we've really invested in software development and we're ramping that up quite quickly. A lot of it's due to COVID and forced change in our buyer persona. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it took years to fund that. But it was also time, I feel like the timing coincides more with the adoption curve in education because education wasn't ready for software five years ago, seven years ago. Yeah. That's becoming more and more of an imperative and COVID has accelerated that. 
Yeah, I was going to say it's. Uh, I'm sure it's picked up this last year. <laughs> yeah, I have. For sure. In good ways, and and it's also brought new challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, to go back to like the way you got this first product built. I mean, you're doing it in a bootstrapped way, so it's not like you have a set budget of X dollars that's going to cover a whole product build. I imagine you went through this process differently than a typical software company <laughs> that's funded would go through it. So tell tell us how you worked this magic. Where did you start? How did you figure out how to how to build this thing kind of Lego style, one piece at a time, I imagine? Yeah, well, it's not magic. It's, it's a, a lot of trial and error, made a lot of mistakes, definitely went down a rabbit hole and discovered it was the wrong rabbit hole and, and, you know, course correct. And, you know, obviously we get better and better at it, but we just, it's our job to avoid the big mistakes now, but we definitely make mistakes on the innovation path early on. You know, we, so our product is a service at its core. So I decided to offer speech and language therapy services because I had a linguistics background. I had worked with a scientist, a speech scientist, and I felt like I understood the value proposition, the need, the challenge, and I had worked in schools and I knew there was a need in school. So all that experience that I had accrued up to that point kind of married in this offering of a speech language therapy service. So early on, you know, you get Adobe Connect and you get some other kind of software and you piece them together and you get content and you start working. We started working with publishers like Pearson or ProEd and some of these that could, would allow us to use assessment materials. And, and that's how it got started. We just piecemealed software together built by other companies so that we could offer a service as our product, right? And then we got in there and schools would give you this feedback and then therapists would give you this feedback. And uh, we decided to, you know, start building software about five years ago. And based on the feedback, we started, uh, you know, replacing a, one system with our own proprietary code, right? Mm -hmm. Still, we had piece, we had decided to integrate uh, Adobe Connect as the video conferencing component. Mm -hmm. So we had, we had some really important build versus buy decisions. We also depended on partners for content and assessments, but then you get feedback to, to, Hey, we need occupational therapy. So you go call up your occupational therapy expert friends and you say, how is this done? How do we provide occupational therapy through video conferencing? Right. And then again, you, you, you get them involved. You learn from that experience. You get, real occupational therapists delivering it, who are giving feedback. And then you do the same thing with school psychology and mental health. And that therapeutic experience in schools is really what we're offering. And those different services are what make up the therapy experience within mm -hmm. school. So that's an important constraint for us because we're not going to go out and just offer anything and everything that a school district would want us to. We tried some, you know, we tried things like uh, interpreters or uh, special education teachers or some of these other things, and then learned pretty quickly that that was outside our business definition of what our expertise was. So we had to say, you know what, we're going to decline on that opportunity because it's outside the scope of our expertise. And I think mm -hmm. that as a small company, it's tempting to chase a lot of shiny objects or whatever people want you to, to solve for them. And that's a learning experience for us, right? Uh, and over the years, we've gotten a little more sophisticated at evaluating those opportunities, but you definitely, at least we definitely had to learn which ones were within our wheelhouse. Oh yeah. So to be tactical for a minute then, when you started building your own software, I mean, first I applaud piecing together other people's software in order <laughs> yeah. to deliver. I mean, it's, it's such an efficient way to do it. So good job on that. Jumping ahead though, when you did start actually building tactically, how did you go about that? Did you hire someone in house? Did you work externally with a group that you wanted to start putting things together for you? Like, how did you piece that strategy together? 
Yeah, I think one thing that I had to decide was, am I a technical leader or not? And I think the mistake I made five years ago was that I, because of con capital constraints, I just said, okay, I can be the technical leader. And so what I did was I hired good people with less experience and learned that that was the wrong decision. And not because they weren't good at what they did or, or not because they weren't good people or cultural alignment, but because I wasn't the technical leader that this, that this organization needed. So that was our first misstep was me thinking or deciding that I should be that person. And, and then over the course of maybe a year or so, decided I would start, you know, looking for people who were actual, you know, really experienced, technically sound. And then I brought on some good people who are still on the team today. And so over the course of the years, uh, these past uh, two or three years, those individuals have, have laid a much better foundation. So now our team it consists of, of uh, 12 engineers, right? Between QA and, and uh, front end, back end, architecture, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Good size team too. Yeah, you gotta well, keep- uh, More recently, you know, I mean, it's interesting yeah. because, sorry, I, I, one other, one other thing, because I always getting to a million or 2 million is it, it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. It was way harder than I thought it was going to be way more cash constrained. You're, you know, you've got to do a ton of different roles cause I'm bootstrapped. Right. And then going from two to 10 million is a different kind of hard because you're stretched more thin without the resources to do more, to, to do more and to try and solve more. And so, you know, it, it really is a, a balancing act. And I think looking back, I made mistakes on investing in one area when I should have invested in a different area. So my point being is I would have invested in technology earlier than I did. And that was one of the missteps that I made. Gotcha. So knowing what you know, you, you would go back and start earlier. Were there constraints at that time though, that would have prevented you from doing it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at that time, uh, look, cash is king. Like that's a real saying it's, it's true in application because if you don't have the money, you can't do it. Um, that was our biggest constraint. And I think I was a little bit scared, right? because I couldn't see the future. Um, I mean, I was trying to make sure all our bills were covered and I was scared. I was scared to invest in the technology because I didn't know if it would have a return. So this is kind of a chicken and an egg situation where, yeah, in hindsight, it's 2020, but at the time that was a really, really hard decision. And when I brought in these, these engineers who are now on the team today, still, that was a big decision for me. It was a really big decision because, you know, I was committing to, uh, you know, investing in that, not knowing, are we really ready to invest in that? Right. Well, now you know the answer, right? You absolutely now I do. Yeah. Yeah. But and man, so, that moment, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, there's so many things that you can do with the limited resources that you have, right? At any yeah. given moment. And so choosing to make an investment in software, is ultimately a long-term investment, right? It is. I mean, like that's painful, right? It's hard to, to commit resources to that. Yeah. Because at that time, you know, you hear all the horror stories. Oh, we haven't, you know, this percent of businesses fail, um, by the, by five years and, this many businesses fail by this point. And, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know, may, maybe that's one of my weaknesses, but I cared so much and I care so much about succeeding with Iluma that that made me a little bit fearful. Right. And so I think that, that I would look back in hindsight and tell Jeremy, don't be so fearful. It's not the end of the world. But at the time, it felt like the end of the world if I had failed. And there's still opportunity for failure. 
but I have more perspective today than I did then. And we're dealing with more resources today than we were then. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, so I want to ask you kind of a high level question about your entrepreneurial experience. So uh, tell us about a time when you felt like this wasn't going to work <laughs> and what, what was going on and how did you get through it? Oh man, which one? <laughs> Shoot. Okay. I, I, I want. Yeah. I've got a couple I, I would say these, I look back and I, I think, wow, that, that was a moment where I could have changed the trajectory of the business or my life. And the first one was in 2006, let's see here, 2016. I was an implementation consultant at Workfront. Back then it was known as that task. And my wife told me, hey, we need to replace our income if you're gonna go full time on this gig. And she had been telling me that and, and I, I knew in my heart that I needed to do that. Um, but she was a great uh, sounding board and, and steady hand. And, um, you know, I even, I mean, I even interviewed with Amazon. I flew up to Seattle and I interviewed with Amazon thinking, well, maybe I should go get a different job and I should follow the, you know, career path of working for the man and kind of doing that thing. And um, that spring, I was at my in-laws house and I was sitting down and we were with my in-laws and they just said, well, why don't you do it? And it was a simple question. It was a really simple question. Like, why don't you just quit your job as an implementation consultant instead of interviewing at these other companies or trying to look for something and just do it? Why not just try it? And it was the context of you're young, you don't have as many commitments, you don't have as many financial obligations. And it was weird. My wife and I clicked and it was like, we're doing this. So it, it could have easily gone a different direction. The other time was in 2017. So this was just I mean, a year and a half later, we had started, you know, we, we had, we had grown, but we're still bootstrapped. And our business model was to bill hourly for our services. I had a really good sales rep. She brought in a ton of contracts in the spring of 2017. And then, and I was thinking, man, I made the right decision a year ago. We made, we brought in a lot of contracts. And then by September, these schools had reneged on those contracts. Oh no. Broke the caseload. And I found myself sitting there with 65% less contract value than I had thought. I had hired a team. We were planning on going after it. And so from October to December of 2017, I call it the mini crisis and we put it in our company playbook and my team knows about this. And personally, I thought it was the end of the world. Like I had the pressure of the world. I was depressed. I'm not going to, I'm not treating this lightly because this is a serious thing. I became suicidal and it was dangerous. In December, I was listening to a podcast by Tony Robbins. It was over holiday break and I was at the lowest I've ever been in my life. I was suicidal. I was feeling worthless and I had tied up all my worth in the success of this. And Tony Robbins, you know how he is. He's, if you've heard him, he shakes you. He speaks with, with experience and confidence. His background gives him credibility and something flipped inside me, right? A switch flipped and I realized that I had been researching a business model for the past six months and I needed to work with my team to literally burn the old model and institute the new model in January of 2018. And I was like, oh, we need to do that. So anyway, we come back from break and uh, still didn't know still had to make some restructuring decisions, had to let people go. It was, I'm telling you, man, this was, this was the hardest experience I've ever had as a leader and as a human being, but I was still committed to it because there were good people around me mm -hmm. who are still on the team today, 
who buoyed me up and believed in our vision. And we launched a per student model and burned the hourly model. And with that per student model, I'm not joking, our profitability increased by 10 to 12% almost overnight. Um, as we transitioned the contracts to a per student subscription. Uh, and then within six months, we started to become profitable. <laughs> if I would have given up and given in the towel, that would have been the end of something mm -hmm. that is beautiful today. And I'm, I mean, we still face challenges. We'll face new challenges. But if you really believe in what you're doing, you will find a way. I've got goosebumps Period. all over, Jeremy. I got goosebumps all over. That's an amazing I mean, I, story. Well, whether it's amazing or not, I, for me, it was absolutely life changing. And I mean, I would give credit to people by name, but I would probably miss some names. So I'm not going to. But these people literally know who they are and they made it happen. It was a team effort and it was challenging. But we look at it today and we went through a refiner's fire. That's incredible. So. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's such a personal thing to share. Um, it is. And, and I mean, the only reason I'm willing to share that is because I know my team knows it, you know, and I, it, we are human, we make mistakes. And what defines us is what we do with those mistakes. It's what we do with the objections. It's what we do with the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And the human spirit is literally unconquered. Like it, it, it can't be conquered as humans. We can overcome things if we decide in our minds. And that's what Tony Robbins did for me. I, I a, a switch literally flipped and I realized I'm not living my potential. I need to get off my victim chair. I need to see, I need to get some help. Right. So I got professional help. I need to say that because mm -hmm. I did get professional help. I did get what I needed to do to get my mind right. And, and slowly but surely things started to come together as we continued. That's amazing. Well, besides, you know, making sure your team sees this, I think I might take this cut out and just send it to Tony Robbins because I'm pretty sure he could use it in one of his promotional videos. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, hey, send it to Tony Robbins. You know, he's, he's just one of the guys that I look to as, as just, you know, a, a good exemplar of, of living to your potential. That's amazing. All right, so last last couple of minutes here. I always like to hand the mic back to you. Imagine you're standing on a stage in front of a few thousand people and Ooh. imagine that they're all entrepreneurs who are currently in the trenches, haven't made it out the other side yet, early stages. What would you want them to know in order to keep going and make it, say to at least where you're at now? I know the journey's not over, but to know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Um, well, my palms are sweating. I'm feeling nervous as I envision all those thousands of people. But, but you know, I, what really matters is that you are authentic to what you want to accomplish. And what will keep you going through the tough times is truly believing in the cause that you've chosen to believe in you won't get through the obstacles and the hard times if you're working for someone else's vision. It has to become your own. It has to become what you believe in. And as an entrepreneur, I'm building something that is a collision of all my passions. I studied linguistics, my mom's, my mom's life and her memory, you know, my love for, for family, my own kids, I'm a kid at heart and I some I have to make sure to be on my best behavior, but all those things collide and I'm doing something that I truly am passionate about and I love to do. So for me, yes, all those challenges are hard, but what keeps me going beyond those challenges is my passion for it. And, and uh, you know, I think that any person who's willing to go take on that, that risk and take on a challenge, you've got to have kind of an uncanny, maybe even a little bit of naivete and a huge dose of optimism about what you're doing, because there will be a lot of people 
who either pull you down, try to pull you down, or just don't think you can do it. And it's, it's really going to come from you and your close tight knit group of people that are, are going to put, pull you through those hard times, you know, but, but really in the end, it's worth it. And it's worth it because not because of money, not because of fame or anything like that, but because of the satisfaction of finishing what you started. Right. And you have to, whether you fail or you succeed, you have to be okay with it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's, that's the lesson I'm still learning. Amazing. Thank you so much for, for sharing that uh, words of wisdom. You know, I think wisdom is a, an interesting concept, right? Because you can really only have yeah. wisdom if you've experienced something. So yeah. the ability to be able to share that is just really valuable and it's always unique. So thank you for, for sharing that. And thank you for, for joining us and telling the story. You know, Eluma is obviously making a big impact on the world and, and touching the lives of tens of thousands of people who need it, especially youth. You know, I'm a sucker for young people who are discovering who they are and figuring out their value in the world. So um, thank you again for joining us. And um, I'm excited to take this, this story out to the world. This is awesome. Well, thank you, Jesse.